and welcome mindsetters to this session of learn extra grade 11s welcome 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 to this live session i'm ty and i'm here with phil who's going to be taking us through today's session what's happening today phil okay well today we're going to be finishing off with our section on the lithosphere and some of those uh, minerals that we can extract from the earth and okay. today we're talking about the iron and steel industry all right cool that mm. sounds really interesting all right so on that note while well, you make your way across the board i'm going to tell the mindsetters mindsetters as i always say make sure you get on the page Great Levens, make sure you chat to us. Let us know what you're thinking, if you're lost in here, if you need help. And if there's some grade 12s who are also just watching, just to watch, it's cool. <laughs> Join in with us. And I have these awesome Casio calculators and this labor to give away. So mindsetters, I cannot stress enough. Get on the page, chat to us. Again, these will only go to the best post. And if you don't post, well, you've kind of just disqualified yourself. But anyway, on that note, mindsetters, mindsetters, I cannot stress enough. Chat to us. Let us know what you're thinking. And what I'd also like to say is, I want to send a quick shout out to Liberty. Thank you for sponsoring the show. And on that note, this is where I hand over to Phil. Phil, take it away. Thank you so much, Ty. As I said, uh, we're going to be starting to take a look at the iron and steel industry. So I've got in my hand a butter knife. Now, this is not a knife used to stab anyone, and I hope that you guys don't do anything like that. But the reason that I can hold this in my hand is something actually quite amazing has happened over the last 200 years. Uh, this piece of steel in my hand is actually amazing. You guys take this for granted that you can actually hold a metal in your hands. Now, the question is, where does this actually come from? And in the last two weeks' episodes, what we've been doing is we've been trying to find out how can I change the earth beneath my feet into something very useful. Now, I use this implement every day in my life, and I'm pretty sure that you guys climb into cars, you climb into taxis, into buses, into trains. And all of those things depend on the iron and steel industry. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at the iron and steel industry and figure out where do these materials actually come from. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this down and get straight into the lesson. Let's start talking about this thing called iron. Now, most of you guys have actually figured out that iron is an element, but steel is not. Now, they are related to each other. So I just want to make sure that people actually understand the difference between iron and steel. So what we're going to do is just make a few notes as we always do. Iron is the element. This is the element Fe. Okay, it's found on your periodic table. So Fe over there is an element which I can find. Okay, steel is a combination of this element with other things. Now steel is what's known as an alloy. So I hope that you guys can read. I'm just writing here with my finger there. So that is called an alloy. An alloy is a mixture of a metal with another element. That means that it is no longer a pure metal. So steel is usually a mixture of iron and carbon, but we're going to see where that carbon is going to come from a little bit later and why on earth we'd want to mix a pure element with something else. So just to recap what I'm talking about, iron is the element... And what you'll actually find is that most iron doesn't have the properties that I need. So I make it into something called steel. And that is an alloy, which is a mixture of a metal with another element. Okay, so let's just cover some of the points that I expect you to know by the end of this section. Now, even if you guys are not covering steel and iron industry at school, what I want you to do is see this as a revision lesson, for, uh, especially for redox. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of that reduction in oxidation chemistry and throw it in here. So grade 11s, even the grade 12s should be watching this. We're going to figure out how to make this element iron out of the ground beneath my feet. Now, I can tell you now that you guys have got tons of iron and steel around around you. Even the surroundings of this uh, particular board that I'm working on is made of steel. Now, without steel and iron, there's no possible way that I'd actually manage to make any of these things inside the studio. Even the camera in front of me is made out of steel and iron. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start taking a look at what is important inside this section. Okay, a lot of information on the board. I'm pretty sure that my producer is going to make it all full screen for you fairly soon. And we're going to highlight some of the important pieces which I expect you to know by the end of the lesson today. Okay, so now here's one of the important pieces of information that iron is a transition metal. Okay, now what does that actually mean? It means that we're inside the middle of the periodic table. So that's our four first piece of information. Now what the transition metals can do for us is they can actually change their personality. Now, it, uh, it can become iron 2 plus, so that means that it can two, lose two electrons to become a 2 positive ion, or it can become Fe3 plus. Now, we're going to pay attention to Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus in a moment. Okay, now, pure iron itself is a, sh a shiny silver metal as, as a butter knife, as I showed you before, and it reacts with many non-metals. Now, this is particularly important. 
the, uh, the reaction between iron and non-metals is something which has happened. And this is one of the reasons that you don't actually find metallic iron out in nature. There's tons of non-metals all around which have already reacted with metal. You don't find pure iron in nature. So that brings up my next point. I cannot find it in its pure state. You will not find a block of iron if you walk out in nature unless man has actually made it that way. It is found as iron ore. And now let's just highlight some of these important pieces of information again. Right, so it's a shiny silver metal. That is one of its physical properties. And it reacts with many non-metals. That's a chemical property. So it reacts quite readily. Okay, so in nature it's not found in its pure state, but it's found as iron ore. So these are important words. Okay, here's the part which we're going to get to, and this is the part which I really love. Okay, so iron ore, this contains the iron, but now it's not pure. Iron ore is another name for a mineral which contains an element which I want. Let me just repeat that again. When you hear the word ore, this is a rock or a mineral which contains an element of interest. Okay, so here I'm interested in iron, so I'm going to go outside and I'm going to find myself a rock with iron inside. That rock is called iron ore. So this contains either hematite, which is the name of one of the ores, and that is Fe203, or magnetite, Fe304. Now, just coincidentally, magnetite is the first magnetic uh, material which has been found, and very often uh, magicians used to use magnetite because they could show that rocks were actually attracted to each other. You can actually magnetize magnetite. Cool thing about magnetite is you can use it to store information as well, like hard drives inside computer disks. You can actually store information using magnetite. So, so pretty useful stuff. But now that's not what we're talking about today. We're not talking about its magnetic properties. What we are going to say today is I want me some iron. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go get some iron out of the ground. It's going to be stuck inside a rock. I'm going to show you how to get iron out and how it's likely to have been found by our ancestors. Okay, so let's get into this. So now I want to figure out where does this stuff come from. Okay, well, first of all, iron is hugely abundant. Iron is everywhere in the universe. And what you'll find is that iron is one of the most abundant metals that there actually is. And one of the reasons is that it's got the most stable nucleus and therefore is very, very abundant. So when stars collapse and explode, what happens is they spew out and they spread a whole bunch of iron all over the universe. So there we go. It's the most stable nucleus, and that means that when a, when a star collapses, it's going to produce a whole bunch of iron. And for that reason, it actually gives a star a red color, and that's called a red giant. Okay, so iron has got the most stable nucleus, and that's why it's so abundant. Now, the Earth's core is made up of iron and nickel. Now, there's lots and lots and lots of iron and nickel inside every single solid planet. So in Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, what we find is that there's a huge amount of iron and nickel. We're not entirely sure about the gas giants further out in the solar system. What you'll find out is that all of the solid planets, um, the rocky planets, have got a huge amount of iron and nickel inside them. That's one of the reasons they, they speculate that those planets might be closest, but they're not entirely sure. And you can actually find iron and nickel in a lot of asteroids as well out there in the solar system. Okay, so the Earth's core has got a whole bunch of the stuff. Now, the problem is I, I cannot go dig down to the Earth's core because if you've been, if you've been watching, the Earth's core is incredibly hot. There's a lot of pressure, and it's liquid, so you can't really sli uh, swim through liquid metal. That's not going to happen very easily. Okay, so now the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to find out what the deal with iron is. It says that it's very reactive, and it reacted long ago with oxygen. So what we've got to do is we've got to figure out what iron does when it's mixed with oxygen. So what I'm going to do is we're going to write a very, very simple equation, and we're going to try to figure out what happened to iron when the Earth was forming its oxygen atmosphere. Okay, so there was a lot of iron inside there. So what we're going to do is now we're going to combine it with atmospheric oxygen which they believe came from the photo photosynthetic bacteria. So I'm going to take Fe plus O2, and we're going to combine them together. Now, here's the problem. Iron can't decide if it's going to make 2 plus or 3 plus. But if it's given enough oxygen, what eventually happens is that iron goes to a 3 plus oxidation state. So what does that word mean, oxidation state? That's kind of confusing. So what I'm going to tell you now is that iron likes to make an Fe3 iron. So what we're going to do is we're going to make iron, and this is stock notation. So I'm going to say this is iron 3 oxide that we're going to make. Now, just a reminder on what I'm talking about here is that iron itself is possible to make 
sorry, let me just rephrase that. It's possible that it can make 3 plus or 2 plus. Now, in this case, if you're given enough oxygen, iron is going to make iron 3 oxide. There's a more common name for this, and this is actually called rust. Now, if you've ever left something which is made of iron out, outside, what you'll find is that very quickly, if it's exposed to the air and it's exposed to a little bit of water, is that iron oxide forms all over it, and it's got that very particular color. We're going to talk about this color in a moment, and that is the color of the Fe3 plus iron. If I ask you to take a look at rust, what you're looking at is that sort of reddish, orangish color, that is Fe3 plus. So iron 3 oxide, how do I form this formula? Well, I know that iron 3 means iron 3 plus. Oxide means O with a 2 minus attached to it. Now, how do I combine them? Well, the first thing I've got to do is make sure that they come together in equal amounts, equal pluses, and equal minuses. So how do you get 3 plus and 2 minus to be the same thing? Well, let's get 6 of each. So that means that I need another Fe3 plus. So that means there need to be two of them. So this is a little bit of grade 10 revision, but quite useful nonetheless. So I'm going to say O2 minus. I hope you can read my messy writing. Okay, so I've got Fe3 plus, Fe3 plus, O2 minus, O2 minus, O2 minus. So now we've got a formula. So what I'm going to say is that I'm going to make Fe2 O3, and that is the formula of rust. So if ever you see rust on something which is metal outside, that orange color that starts to form on metal, that is Fe2O3, and that is the name for iron 3 oxide. It makes a mineral. That's called hematite. So I'm sure that most of you at home have actually um, realized that this is not a balanced chemical reaction. So let's try and balance this out. Well, I'd advise that you leave iron till last because I can put as many as I like. Oxygen is a bit of a problem because it only comes in twos and comes out as threes. So let's fix the oxygen problem first and let's get back to the iron. So let's do oxygen first. I need equal amounts on either side. So on the left, I see that I've got twos and on the right, I've got threes. And the only way to get the same on both sides is to get three O2s and to get two of the iron oxides. Now the iron is not balanced. I've got four iron on the left um, that I need to put in to balance out with four iron on the right. So now that I've balanced this all out, this is what naturally happened to iron three, and it made iron oxide. Now the question is, how do I get it back? And that's a bigger problem. So we need to dig up reserves of Fe2O3 and Fe3O4. Remember that was magnet magnetite. These minerals are called ore. So let's just highlight those two types of minerals. OK, so there was Fe2O3, so that's the whole bunch of rust. Okay, and Fe3O4. So there's a couple of minerals which we need to dig out the ground, and these minerals are called ore. Anytime I call something ore, that's a mineral which has got something of interest. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be showing you how we actually get this out. Now, if you see the picture over here, you've actually got that same color of rust inside that picture. This is called open pit mining, and if you've been watching for the last two lessons, Basically, iron ore is everywhere. It's under your feet, and it's one of the reasons that the dirt under your feet has actually got this orange color. Africa is very rich in iron ore. And good for us, iron ore is one of the most profitable minerals to mine on Earth because it's so easy to extract. It's nice and cheap. All you have to do is go dig it up off the surface and change it back into iron. So this is a very, very valuable mineral. So open pit mining means that I can actually dig it directly off the surface of the ground and just carry it away to the, refiner, uh, sorry, to the refinement center in the back of one of these trucks. Now, this picture doesn't tell a story which is very easy to imagine, but one of these trucks is absolutely massive. Each one of these trucks can carry approximately 250 tons. Now, just to put that into perspective, imagine 250 Mini Coopers in the back of this truck. That is how heavy these trucks can actually carry. They are hugely massive. If you stood up next to one of these tires, you would need eight of you to actually stand up to the top of that truck. It's massive. OK, now before we start to take our break, I just want to re-emphasize what we're talking about here. We're going to take iron out of our compounds here. These compounds are called ore. And the way that we get these compounds from the ground is by open pit mining. So I've just got to dig them up off the surface. Now, I want you to start thinking about how am I actually going to convince iron to leave oxygen? Because iron is reactive and iron likes to be with oxygen. I've got proof of this, that if I leave anything which is made up of iron outside in the oxygen, outside in the water, it's going to change back into one of these two minerals. 
So on that note, I think it's time for a short ad break. We're going to give you guys a little bit of time to breathe. What do you think, Ty? I think so too, because this is a lot of information, but Huge. fascinating at the same time. Good. So mindset is, as I've been saying earlier, make sure you use this page. Post if you've got any questions that you guys might want to ask, if you lost any, if you need help. Post, post, post on the page. But on that note, we'll see you after this break. And welcome back, Mindsetters. I hope you had a nice little break there and you did not disappear or go anywhere too far away from the TV. Hope you're now back, ready with your pens and pads out and ready to make notes. Because on that note, this is when we're gonna, I'm going to hand over to Phil who's going to do a little experiment. So Phil, what do we have there? Okay, well, what I'm going to be doing here is I'm just going to be showing you the two different states of iron. What we're going to do later on is we're going to change one into the other. So what I've got on the right-hand side here is I've actually got a little bit of some iron 3. What I've done is I've made sure that I've got some pellets that you can actually see a very nice color. You can see that sort of very strong orange color that it's actually got. Now this is iron 3. Now this is iron 3 chloride. The reason that I've chosen it is because it's actually got a slightly gentler color and you can actually see the iron 3's color on its own. Now on the right hand side is what we want and that is iron powder. Now, I need iron on its own to actually make implements like this. So if I want to make something like this, I've got to change something that looks like that into something which looks like this. And that's a little bit of a problem. I've got to convince iron 3 plus that it actually wants to become an element again. And that's quite difficult. That's where redox chemistry actually comes into play. So now when I want to take this iron 3 and I want to change it into an implement, the question is, how do the mines actually do it? Well, before the break, I actually showed you that the iron 3 is gotten from or extracted from that iron ore, that hematite. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the hematite now and change it into iron. So let's actually go through to the board and let's see how we can actually do this. So before the break, what I showed you was that open cast mining, that orange material inside there, is one of the ways that we actually dig up iron from the ground. So now this open pit mining was the way that I got the iron 3 plus iron ore, and I actually took this material straight out of that open pit, and now I've got to change it into something much more useful. I've got to change this now into iron the element, and that's where redox comes in. So let's start with this. Now, Iron is transformed by something which is called a blast furnace. So now I can take either one of my minerals. I can take Fe2O3. Remember that was called hematite. So if you're writing notes, just remember that that is hematite or magnetite, which is Fe3O4. Now I'm going to make a couple of notes on this diagram. Now this thing is called a blast furnace. So a blast furnace is the most common way that we can change iron ore back into iron the element. So let's take a look at what goes on inside a blast furnace. Now into the top here you can actually see those two little train pieces and what they're delivering is actually two very important pieces. The two very important components that I put inside are iron ore so that's going to supply us with the Fe and coke. Now this is not coke which you drink. What this is is a very very pure form of coal. Coke is actually a very very pure form of carbon. Now you can get coke from coal. What they do to make coke is they heat up coal to a very high temperature to get rid of any extra pieces and that leaves behind very very pure carbon. It's kind of like a spongy material but coke and iron ore is the stuff which they put inside, inside the top of a blast furnace. Now the reason it's called a blast furnace is because I put this very very hot gas which goes inside there. It doesn't look like the degree sign has come through very nicely. So what we're actually going to say is that that is degrees. Let's draw it in. There we go. So we've got degrees Celsius which is 1400 degrees. Very very hot stuff. Now the reason that we need that type of temperature is to get the molten iron out of the bottom. Molten iron only melts at that sort of temperature and I've got to make sure that that iron is going to stay liquid in order to do something useful for it. When I melt iron, it's going to move into something um, and this is where we can actually start to change it. Now, this is where I want to bring up the idea of steel. So now inside here, you've got a whole bunch of carbon, you've got a whole bunch of iron. What we've got to do with the two is realize that they're going to get mixed up together. There's actually too much carbon inside this iron at the moment. Right, that is called pig iron. So if you actually want to do some notes on, say, on top of there, molten iron which comes out of here is called pig iron. The reason it's called pig iron has got nothing to do with the animal. It's actually got to do with the containers which it goes into. And those are called railway pigs. 
So pig iron is the iron which gets poured inside those crude containers. Pig iron has got way too much carbon. We actually need to reduce the amount of carbon inside there uh, before we can actually change this into a usable form of steel. So at the moment, we've got Fe and we've got carbon, and the mixture of those two together is called steel. So when I mix those two together, I make an alloy which I call steel. And that's the steel which you and I know. Now, that's not exactly the same as the steel which I find inside a knife like the one I showed you earlier. I can always mix other elements inside this. I can mix in some silicon, I can mix in some chromium, I can start to mix in even metals which are like vanadium. Now you might have wondered when am I going to ever use these elements? Well those elements are very useful to mix with iron because it actually gives iron different properties. For instance, if I mix iron with chromium, that makes stainless steel. That's steel which doesn't rust and that's quite useful. Because one of the biggest problems with just normal steel or mild steel is that if I leave it outside, if I leave it in water, it's going to rust incredibly quickly because carbon doesn't protect iron very well. So what I'm going to do is I can mix it up with a whole bunch of silicon or vanadium or chromium. So what we can do is we can add in all sorts of other elements and that changes the properties of the steel. So we can mix in some silicon if we like, we can mix in some chromium, we can mix in all sorts of things, even vanadium. If you go find a spanner inside a tool shop, very often it says vanadium steel. And that means that we've mixed in, mixed in the element V for vanadium. And that's a very useful element. So you can mix in any one of these symbols, or mix in any one of these elements rather, and make different types of steel. Now that changes the properties of those steel. Okay, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to focus on this reaction inside the, the blast furnace for a second. And let's take a little bit of a closer look as to see what happens inside there. Okay, well, let's just take a look at the balanced chemical equation of what's happening inside the blast furnace. Well, the basic idea is that I've taken my hematite, I've taken my coke, and I'm producing the iron, and I'm producing carbon dioxide. So I'm going to make a few notes as we go through this. Okay, so here in is my iron ore. So there's the iron ore over there. And that is the raw material. That's the stuff that I want to change into steel itself. Over here, if you were listening carefully, the carbon itself is called coke. And that's a very pure form of carbon. Now what comes out, this is the stuff that I'm really after. So this is iron itself. And it comes out as a liquid because it's very, very hot. The melting point for iron is around about 1,400 degrees. And... Um, Obviously, I've got to be able to move the iron. If it just made a solid of iron, there's not much I can do about it, and there's no way that I can actually move it out of my blast furnace. So the only way I can do that is at 1,400 degrees to melt my iron. Now, here's one of the other problems with the iron industry. And there's a product. It's a gaseous product, which is great. It's very, very easy to separate from the liquid because it just bubbles up to the top and leaves. But carbon dioxide... I wonder if you can start thinking about the types of questions which you can expect about CO2. Remember that CO2 itself is actually a greenhouse gas. That means that it's got an ability to trap heat inside the Earth's atmosphere. So CO2, this is a greenhouse gas. I want you to read up a little bit about the greenhouse effect. It's very, very important and it's leading to climate change all around the world. So the greenhouse gases... These are gases which can trap heat inside the Earth's atmosphere. Please, please, please make sure that you don't actually mix this up with the problems with the ozone layer. Those are completely different gases. So CO2 is a greenhouse gas, meaning that it can trap the heat on the Earth's surface, leading to climate change. And many believe, and there's a lot of evidence for this, that CO2 developed by man's industry is actually changing the climates above us. Okay, now I've put a word down at the bottom of the screen which actually scares a lot of grade 11s and 12s, and that is redox. Let's start taking a look at the redox inside here. What am I actually doing inside this reaction? Well, if you take a look at this reaction, it's actually like a story. I had oxygen which was joined onto iron. They were joined as a compound. Along comes carbon, and carbon decides that it likes the oxygen more than iron. So what it's going to do is it's actually going to steal. It's going to take away that oxygen from iron, and that's exactly what we want to do. Carbon likes, uh, likes oxygen a lot more than iron. What does that mean? It means that carbon is great at taking away the oxygen. Carbon likes to be oxidized. That means that it's a good reducing agent. 
We're going to talk about these terms in a moment. If you're not absorbing that, that's fine. Just listen, try and absorb as much as you can. So let's just say that again. I've got iron at the moment which is oxidized. It has been treated with oxygen. At the moment, it is in an Fe3 plus state. The question is, how do I get it from an Fe3 plus? So let's actually write it in there. So Fe3 plus, how do I change Fe3 plus all the way to become iron? Well, that's a process called reduction. I'm going to change that charge over there. I'm going to change that 3 plus, which is the charge in the iron, into a zero. I'm going to take away all the charge, and the only way that you can take away pluses is by adding negatives. Let me just repeat that again. The only way to get rid of a positive charge is to add some negative charges. I cannot remove pluses. That means that I'm changing the element. Can't do that, guys. The only thing that you can do is add in electrons to get rid of the pluses. So to change Fe3+, plus, I've got to change it into iron over there. Very, very important. Your redox knowledge is absolutely important. That means that iron is in a 3 plus oxidation state. Now, just for interest's sake, the word reduction. So let's actually pay attention to the word reduction. If I take my Fe3+, plus and I change it by adding three electrons, it does become Fe as a metal. The word reduction actually comes from to change the oxidation state down to a lower level. Reduction means the taking down of or the reducing of. So the lessening of this number over here. So we've gone from 3 plus. So I've got iron in a 3 plus or positive 3 oxidation state. So I'm actually going to write the oxidation number of iron over there. So that's plus 3. When we've got an element, just to remind you about oxidation numbers, elements have got the oxidation number of 0. So I've gone from 3 plus or plus 3, if you're writing it as an oxidation number, I've gone all the way through to zero. I'm sure you'll agree that that is a reduction of that number, and that's where the word actually comes from. So I'm adding these three electrons. Now, I've got to start asking myself, where are these three electrons actually going to come from? Well, if I'm trying to reduce iron, I need three electrons. And the thing to give me the three electrons, these come from carbon. So carbon likes to give away its electrons. Why? Because it's a non-metal. So um, well, it's a metalloid, so it can behave like either. Carbon is better at giving away its electrons than other non-metals. So if you tried to do this with chlorine or if you tried to do this with any of the other non-metals, it wouldn't work so well. So carbon being a metalloid can behave like a metal by giving away its electrons. And here they are. So these are from carbon. So carbon is giving its electrons. And that is, remember that pure form of carbon, which is called coke. So I've actually taken Fe3+, plus and I've added on three electrons, and I've become iron. That's the whole deal behind the iron industry. This is a very profitable industry, and one of the things which led to the Industrial Revolution. Now, if you started taking a look at buildings which were built longer than about 200 years back, you wouldn't find any buildings which were taller than about two or three stories high. One of the reasons for this is because we didn't have an abundant source of iron and an easy way to make it. The development of blast furnaces powered us through the industrial, indu um, industrial Revolution, and that's one of the reasons that we can get these big skyscrapers. Now, just coincidentally, iron actually starts to weaken at certain temperatures, and this is one of the reasons behind the World Trade Center collapse when there were the terrorist attacks in uh, 2001. Iron actually starts to weaken at about um, 625 degrees, so what you'll find is that iron is not a great idea if you're going to have hot fires inside buildings, which I hope that they're not planning to. Okay, so again, iron is one of the major things which contributes towards very, very, very tall skyscrapers, and it's one of the backbones of most industries. They can actually tell how well a country is doing by how much iron it actually produces. But I think it's almost time for an ad break. What do you think? I think so too, because okay. it's a lot. Information bombardment, read off <laughs> left and right. Okay, <laughs> so, right, so just to remember, uh, sorry, let me just rephrase <laughs> that again and start speaking English. Okay. So just a reminder of what we've talked about now. I've got iron 3 plus. We're trying to do the reduction all the way down to iron. What I want you guys to do is actually start asking some questions because I want to make this into an iron section and a redox section. So if you guys have got redox about the iron industry or any of the other mining industries, I actually want to turn this into a little bit of a revision lesson. Maybe you guys can help each other out. What do you think, Ty? I think so too. They must, that's what I've been saying to the mindsetters. If you see a mindset in trouble, always share your information if you have it. Mm. But on that note, mindsetters, make sure, as I keep saying, get on the page, get chatting to us. As Phil said, make sure you have questions. 
But on that note, we'll see you after this break. And welcome back, Mindsetters. I hope you had a nice little break there and you're ready, you're back, and you're revved up to go for this next session. And yes, as I always say, have your pens and pads out and ready to make notes. And as I'm saying, I'm also looking out for that awesome post. Guys, as I said, you can post anything if it's regarding to the subject matter if it's a quote or anything that you think would be helpful to anybody you can be free to post it if it's image images that are based on the subject matter post 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 and you can win these awesome awesome prizes but on that note this is where i hand back to phil phil take it away absolutely thank you ty okay well during the ad break ty told me that there were some great questions about the blast furnace so i'm just going to turn our attention back to the blast furnace where all the magic actually happens now Somebody was asking me, first of all, why it's called a blast furnace. Okay, well, the, um, the blast furnace refers to this hot air which needs to go into the bottom. Now, this is a very simple diagram. What it doesn't actually tell us is that I actually need to feed in some very, very hot air down at the bottom. It's a hot air blast, and that's where this name actually comes from. So a hot air blast, right, and that is very, very hot, at 1,400 degrees Celsius. Now, you guys are not ever going to get that sort of temperature anywhere inside the weekend bry. But coincidentally, this is one of the places that they believe that iron was actually first discovered by our ancestors. Now, these ovens themselves kind of closely resemble some of the ovens that our ancestors might, might have used to, to cook food or to heat implements or when they were starting to deal with other metals, easier metals to extract like copper. Now, if you start to take a look at this thing, it starts to take a look a little bit like an oven. Now, I just want to draw out a diagram, and we'll get back to the other question in a moment. Now, if you started to take a look at the design of very, very early ovens, you'll actually find that if you made a hole in the ground, now, just a reminder that a hole in the ground, the ground itself, has actually got a huge amount of iron inside there. The reason that the earth has actually got that kind of dusty brown color is because there's a whole bunch of Fe2 O3 inside the earth. Now, if you start building a fire inside there, if I start to build a coal fire and I start to put my wood inside there, what you'll find is that I've actually got a whole bunch of carbon which is in contact with the earth around it. Now, if you pump a whole bunch of really, really hot air inside there, if you blow inside it and you start to create a very, very high temperature, what you can actually start to get is a reaction between those two. And this is one of the things that might have produced the first iron which was made by man. So I've got carbon from the coal inside the wood. I've got the naturally occurring iron ore, which is inside the dirt all around inside your house, outside. If you walk in the street, the next time you look at red dust or orange dust, that's the stuff, Fe2O3. So if I've got carbon and I've got Fe2O3 and they're hot enough inside a fire, what you'll actually find is that they probably found little bits of silver iron inside the bottom of their fire. Now, they might have wondered what the silvery stuff was. I presume it's probably a little bit darker than that because it wouldn't have been very pure. The cool thing about it, it was really, really nice and hard. And the cool thing about that was that you can make something which is nice and sharp. You can make cutting implements out of it. And the cool thing is that you can hammer it out and play with it just like any other metal. The stuff which was made down at the bottom there, I'm pretty sure that people eventually started to mix up coal directly with dirt and wondering if they could get the iron. And this is what led eventually to the Industrial Revolution. Now, this was a very simple idea behind the blast furnace. The iron which I made this way is very, very dirty. It's going to be weak. It's going to rust really quickly. Somebody was asking, why do I use limestone inside the blast furnace? So let's take a look at our blast furnace and let's see why I use limestone. So I've only told you two out of the three pieces which go inside the top. So there's iron ore, there's coke, now there's a third substance which I mix in from the top. Let's actually write in its formula so that you know what I'm talking about. Limestone. Limestone is called calcium carbonate. So CaCO3, that's the stuff. Now we're actually going to put that inside the blast furnace, and I'm going to put that into the top. So CaCO3, which is also called limestone. The reason that that stuff is inside there is because of the stuff at the bottom here, this thing called slag. Now, slag is the waste material. It's the stuff which we don't want. Now, the problem is that the iron ore itself is not very pure. It's got a huge amount, especially of silicon. Silicon is a very common element in the Earth's crust, and I don't actually want too much of it in my steel. It makes the steel very brittle. So CaCO3, that's the stuff which is going to mop up the extra silicon. So CaCO3, limestone, creates something called slag, and it floats on top of my iron. Now, 
This divides up the blast furnace into two pieces. I just want to draw you a very, very simple picture of what's going on inside there. If I draw a blast furnace, if I've got the bottom piece of my blast furnace, it actually separates into two very distinct layers. So if I can picture these two molten layers inside there, I've got my bottom piece, which is my iron, which is going to go at the bottom, and that's going to turn into pig iron. But on top of that, I've got a separate material. Now, it's not purple, but it's another layer of molten material. I call that molten material slag. Now, the way that I remember that it's the slag on the top that I don't particularly want, that's going to go separately. Slag has got a whole bunch of materials which I don't actually want. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not useful. Slag is actually, those, um, is actually one of the materials which is used to make roads as well. Slag makes a very hard, uh, sorry, it makes a very hard mineral, and um, that mineral contains a huge amount of silicon, which is great for making roads. Now, the slag itself is full of silicon and a whole bunch of other elements which I don't particularly want. So it's full of antimony and it's full of arsenic, things which I don't particularly want inside there, even some lead. Now, I don't want these elements inside my steel. I actually want them to leave, and that's why I'm putting in the calcium carbonate. That's actually going to give my slag some body. It's going to easily melt, and it's actually going to purify my steel. It cleans the steel which comes out of here. So this Fe, which is left over, is going to go on to make the pig iron. So let's actually make that the same color. Let's make sure that we're staying the same color as we were before. Okay, so there we go. So the Fe, which comes out of here, is not very pure, but it's much purer if I put in some limestone. So my pig iron there. So my slag is mostly made up of limestone. There we go. So limestone is the third ingredient to make this magic of iron. I need some limestone. And... Uh, that is all the stuff which I put inside this blast furnace, and this is how I make iron. Now the question is, why am I actually doing this? Let's actually start to make a look at, um, sorry, to take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of the iron industry. And I've actually prepared a little bit of a slide, a little bit of summary, and I'm actually going to discuss my way through these things and see if we've actually managed to pick up what's going on here. So let's just skip forward to the advantages and the disadvantages of the iron industry. Once I've actually manufactured this stuff, what am I going to do with it and why is it important? There we go. One of the major advantages is that it provides us with a huge amount of foreign income. We produce a large amount of minerals inside this country. So one of the great ways to make foreign income or foreign currency is actually to sell it to countries like China. China at the moment cannot produce enough steel to support its very, very much growing economy. So we make a lot of money by selling this iron to them. We've got a huge amount of iron which is deposited, especially in the Northern Cape and in Limpopo. And if we can sell the iron ore as a finished product as iron, that's a great way to generate foreign currency. Okay, now these large buildings. Now I'm not just talking baby buildings. We're talking about Santon City. We're talking about the JSE. We're talking about all those massive skyscrapers that you find in the center of Johannesburg. Now the only way that those are possible is because there's steel reinforcement. And of course it creates a huge amount of employment. A great deal of our country's employment, around about 10% actually comes from the mining industry. Digging the stuff up out, out the ground and sending it to somebody like Iscor or Ferris Steel or ArcelorMittal, um, another country which, um, company which actually re refines the stuff, we create a huge amount of employment from the iron industry. So there are some very, very distinctive advantages to creating iron out of the earth's dust. So in taking iron ore, let's just do a little bit of a summary. In taking Fe2, O3, and changing it from dust into Fe, I can actually make steel, I can make buildings, and there's a huge amount of advantage from that. So the iron ore to the iron industry, there are great, great advantages. Now the problem with anything is there's advantages and disadvantages. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time starting to take a look at the disadvantages of iron. Okay, now there is large-scale pollution. Okay, now this is the biggest problem of almost any mining industry. The pollution which comes off there is in the form of some of the slag, some of the gases which are released are poisonous, and one of the major problems from that is it finds its way into the environment and can harm the communities around it, can harm the animals, and harm the ecosystems. Okay, and also this is the other thing which I wanted to talk to you about. Those greenhouse gases, remember that that CO2 is coming out of that blast furnace? 
That's a major, major, major problem of the iron industry. I find that the iron industry is one of the major contributors towards South Africa, and now South Africa, we've got a tiny, tiny population in comparison to the world, but we are the 12th largest contributor towards greenhouse gases. That means that we're producing way more than anyone else on the African continent, and we've got to watch how much steel we're using and how we use our industries. Okay. And then open pit mining, you've got to start thinking about this. If you start digging big holes and you start grading away the surface, you actually destroy the surface. You've taken away the trees, you've taken away the wildlife, and it's actually taking up a huge amount of that, that space that can be used for other things. So it actually destroys that surface. Now, I'm just uh, going to ask Ty, how are things are going on the pages? Well, literally, the page is blowing up. Okay, so, starting to blow up. But the thing is that as I was about to ask questions, I was like, oh no, he's actually covering that. Because a lot of the kids wanted to find out the, the kind of disadvantages to iron in terms of also like Absolutely. sicknesses and tetanus and dangers of rust and things like that. So okay, actually some really, really good questions. Okay, mm. so now it seems like a whole bunch of people have started thinking of their own disadvantages. Okay, now you started to talk about the disadvantages of iron. Well, we're going to divide them up. Now, environmental problems. Now, this is something else which comes up in all mining. If you guys are starting to take a look at disadvantages of all mining, some of the problems with mining is actually the miner's health. And that starts to branch off into a whole bunch of other things. So now, when I'm starting to dig up iron ore, I've got to start talking about the miner's health because their people and their health is very important. It's important to their families that they keep on providing. And, of course, you want a healthy work workforce. You want happy miners because they're going to produce you a lot more um, iron ore and they're going to keep on producing it. Okay, so mining health is a major issue. One of the problems with digging up a whole bunch of dirt is that you actually kick up silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide can lead to a very serious condition called silicosis. The problem with silicosis is you don't know you have it until 20 years' time, and that's a major problem. Silicosis, let's just write it down for everyone at home that's taking notes. Okay, silicosis is a disease which happens when I get a whole bunch of this material called silica. It's a very fine dust, works your way deep into your lungs and starts to irritate your lungs. Now, it keeps on irritating your lungs because your body cannot dissolve this stuff. And that's a major problem with any form of mining. You'll find that this is a problem inside gold industry, inside the platinum industry, um, even inside the iron industry. Anytime there's a whole bunch of dust being kicked up, you find that silicosis is a major, major problem. Okay, so that's one problem with mining health. Now, there is another really, really weird uh, problem that somebody actually started to talk about, and I think Ty brought it up beautifully, was that rust itself is quite a weird thing. It's, it's nice and porous. If you start to make rust on the surface of a material like a nail, what you can actually start to do is you can harbor a bacteria inside there, and that can lead to tetanus. Okay, so tetanus is a disease which is harbored in the form of a bacteria which lives inside iron oxide. Iron oxide itself is nice and porous, can actually support this bacteria for a very long time, and there's actually things called endospores. Those endospores live inside that rust. So if you get yourself on a nice rusty nail, the problem is that that rust can actually harbor the bacteria which causes tetanus, which is sometimes called lockjaw as well. Now, if you do pierce yourself on a rusty nail or anything rusty, you should go see your doctor about tetanus. It's a very, very horrible disease, and it can cause a lot of complications. Are there any more questions about that, the disadvantages, or are people starting to talk nicely about it? What do you think, mm, Ty? It's kind of mixed right now, okay. um, because we also have, well, some people wanted to find out more, as we were saying earlier, the pollution aspect, which you've covered now. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's now going into more processes, as in someone some of the mindsetters wanted to find out, like, for instance, with gold and the smelting process. And okay. Yeah. Well, let's actually start to discuss that. Let's talk about similarities because the way that you can simplify all of this is starting to compare it to other industries. How can I follow away the gold process, the iron process? Well, let's start to compare them. Let's actually make a little bit of space and let's see what the gold industry has in common with the iron industry. So let's start to talk about gold versus iron. Well, let's take a look at the points which, first of all, I find in common. So gold versus iron. Now... Let's find out the things which I do find in common. So now, I find that gold and iron both come from ore. So, so I find both of them in the, in the lithosphere. That means that the Earth's surface contains both these materials. That's the only way that I can actually get them. So I find both of them in something which is called ore. We discussed ore. Ore is any rock. 
or mineral which contains something of interest or something of value. And I find that gold and iron, I have to, be, I have to extract them from there. But now, gold and iron have got very, very different processes. So let's just highlight the differences between them. So that is one major similarity, but that's unfortunately where the similarity stops. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to say that gold is found in its natural state. So I'm going to say that I can actually find gold as an element inside those rocks. So I actually find it as a U. It's found as an element. It's native metal. That means that I can actually find this metal in a rock. This is one of the first ways that we actually found, uh, found gold. And that's one of the reasons that gold was one of the first metals that we actually started working with and finding valuable. People actually walk through riverbeds and you can actually find nuggets of gold. And very, very few um, nuggets of gold actually still exist. This is called alluvial gold. Now, we're talking like 100 years ago, the last time that there was huge amounts of alluvial gold. The reason for that was, well, you can figure this out. If people start walking around in riverbeds and finding pieces of gold, pretty easy to extract. Now, let's highlight that as a difference against iron. Now, I find iron only as a part of compounds. So I can say that iron is found as... Okay, now this is something slightly different. I find that iron is found as... And let's actually spell as correctly. You can see I'm getting a little bit carried away here. So I can see that iron is found as Fe3+. Now, that means that I actually need to convince iron to gain three electrons and go back to being iron itself. So there's the major difference between the two gold industries. Okay, now, if I've got gold industry or if I've got iron industry, there's two very separate ways that I refine them. So it actually, let's actually highlight what those processes are. Now, to refine gold, I use the cyanide process. So I actually use a material called cyanide, which is very, very poisonous. That's why it's famous in movies. If you take around about 50 milligrams of cyanide, that's goodbye to you because cyanide actually starves your body of oxygen. Let's just make sure that we're spelling it nicely because I can't write neatly with this finger and I'm pretty sure people at home are trying to take notes. Okay, so cyanide is that very, very poisonous stuff. Okay, it's been made famous by movies. It's a great way to kill people, but I hope that you never touch this stuff. Cyanide is very, very toxic. I actually find that cyanide can dissolve gold straight out of the rocks and then I can refine it later on. Now, cyanide is a very easy way to dissolve gold but it's also a great way to kill you, so to stay away from it. Okay, so I use cyanide to refine that, but to refine iron, I need a far more messy process. Now, we're going to draw another comparison fairly soon. I've got Fe3+, Fe3+, must actually be done inside a blast furnace. All right, so I use a blast furnace to refine this, and that's where the major difference is, how I actually refine these. Now, Somebody wanted to ask what smelting was. Now, just to give you a, a, a short, brief explanation, smelting was when you change the chemical and the physical properties of a metal. So if I melt something and I reduce it, that means that I'm actually smelting the metal. So now, both of these processes actually refine the metal, but the cyanide process takes two steps. I need to actually get the pure gold and then smelt it. When I'm putting iron inside a blast furnace, this is where iron is smelted. Okay, so let me just repeat what I mean. The process of smelting is not the same as melting. Smelting is when you change the physical and the chemical properties of a metal. So now, if I change Fe, remember that Fe2O3 is a solid material. I'm changing it into Fe, which is a liquid. That process changed this into a liquid and it changed its chemical properties. That process is called smelting. It's not just the same as melting. So melting is a physical process and smelting is a physical and a chemical process and that's why it's got a different name. So when I smelt iron, that's my process. And that really is it. Are there any more questions on the page? I think we've got about a minute or so. What do you think? Yes, we do have a lot of questions because every time I refresh, I get like this pile. So <laughs> I kind of have to sift through it. But I just want to say, Mindsetters, thank you, thank you, thank you. Obviously, they're fascinated by it. So mm -hmm. Mindsetters, make sure, make sure that you keep on getting those questions in. So right now, I'm just scanning through. Um, okay, we have one question from Yajna who's been on the page because apparently her electricity went out. So literally, she's just trying to get as much info as you can. Um, she was based on the founder, where was the first gold deposit discovered in South Africa, if you happen to know? 
I'm not entirely sure, but I know that one of the major deposits was obviously on the Vitwatas run, mm. is, is the home to one of the biggest reefs. Mm. And then she also wanted to find out uh, basically the refining process of gold, but we've kind of just covered that in a okay, way. Okay, well, sa sadly that was last mm. week's topic, but basically I dissolve the gold out of, out of my mineral, out of the ore, and then I'm going to reduce it back with zinc. So it's a two-part process. So first I dissolve it with cyanide, and then I deposit it out with zinc metal. So it's a two-part process, unlike the iron. Okay, and Michael wants to now find out also as much as there's iron disadvantages, are there gold disadvantages as well? Absolutely. Okay, mm. gold has got very much the same disadvantages. You use poisonous chemicals like cyanide. Um, it, any sort of major heavy industry creates huge amounts of carbon dioxide as well, so that's also a greenhouse gas. Mm. Um, any sort of mining is going to create some sort of pollution. All right. So on that note, this has also been fascinating for me. And mindset is, yes, it, this is great stuff. Like, this is the most active I've seen the page in a while. So this That's is fantastic. really, really good. Like, mindset is, I cannot congratulate you guys enough. Like, you guys did great stuff today. And as I keep saying, mindset is, if you see a mindset in trouble, help them out. If you know the answer, post, post, post. Because as you've seen today, we might not be able to get to all of your questions. But we do try our best. But on that note... I just want to say thank you to Liberty, thank you for sponsoring, and I will be scanning through this pile of amazing questions to find our winners for today. But again, mindset is I just want to say thank you, and for me and Phil, this is where we say see you and see you next time.